The Jewish Channel's Week in Review. More basketball superstars hanging out at JCC's. Netanyahu softens his stance on the Palestinians, saying goodbye to one of the most prominent Jewish members of Congress, and more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now on this episode of the Week in Review. Hello, and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. The Israeli government is softening its stance on the Palestinian government in the West Bank. The Palestinian Authority will be receiving $100 million in tax revenues that had been withheld by Israel in recent months after the PA sought recognition as a state at the United Nations Cultural Agency. The administration of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and that of President Barack Obama had been taking a number of steps to penalize the PA for its unilaterally seeking statehood. Now, we're seeing the Netanyahu administration begin to soften that stance, even over the very strong objections of the far-right members of his governing coalition, and especially Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman of the Israel Beitenu party. Lieberman swore this week that his party would, quote, do everything possible, unquote, to prevent the funds from moving into Palestinian hands. Netanyahu, on the other hand, was quoted telling a legislative committee that he was transferring the funds now because relations with the Palestinians had, quote, calmed down. Netanyahu further claimed that the PA has paused its efforts to seek statehood recognition at the UN. For TJC viewers, this last claim by Netanyahu should be only somewhat surprising. We reported in recent weeks that PA officials had decided not to pursue further recognition at the UN's more minor agencies. However, Netanyahu's message here seems to be that the PA has also paused its efforts at the Security Council, which would be news. Of course, as we've also reported in recent weeks, announcements from world leaders in the Security Council suggested that Palestinian statehood would not receive a majority of votes. This latest move by Netanyahu, in which he is softening his stance on Palestinians and enraging the right wing of his coalition, could be evidence that Netanyahu, like former Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon before him, is making a move towards the center before his re-election efforts get underway. But if Netanyahu seems to be succeeding at getting some concessions out of the Palestinian Authority of late, new problems are coming out of Lebanon. Four rockets were fired into Israel from Lebanon this week, the first rockets to be fired from Lebanon since at least 2009. No one was injured in the attacks, but two buildings were damaged and a gas tank was struck, leading to a fire that required hours to suppress by firefighters. An al-Qaeda affiliate called the Sheikh Abdullah Azam Brigades claimed responsibility for the attacks, but Israel said it is holding the Lebanese government and army responsible for preventing cross-border attacks. Meanwhile, when it comes to Israel and U.S. support, the pre-Thanksgiving Republican presidential primary debate touched on the topic. Here's a summary of what was said. And if Israel had a credible plan that, that it appeared as if they could succeed, I would support Israel, yes. And the right course for Israel is to show that we care about Israel, that they are our friend, we'll stick with them. If I'm president of the United States, my first trip, my first foreign trip, will be to Israel to show the world we care about that country and that region. Interest. It's called Israel. Uh, we're a friend and ally. They're a friend and ally. We need to remind the world what it means to be a friend and ally of the United States. Our interest in the Middle East is Israel. And if we're going to be serious about saving Israel, we better get serious about Syria and Iran, and we better get serious right now. You know, maybe the first trip I would take to Israel. But whatever happens in the presidential elections in 2012, the congressional elections next year will see one of the most long-standing and well-known Jewish members of Congress no longer on the ballot for the first time in decades. Barney Frank, the Democrat from Massachusetts, is well known for a number of things, including his brashness and outspoken nature. He's also the first member of Congress to be out of the closet as a gay man and repeatedly invoked Jewish heritage and values in making the case for various policy positions over the years. And while the congressman who will no longer have access to the House of Representatives gym might be expected to spend some time in his retirement at a Jewish community center, J.C. Seams seem to be the new favorite hotspots for locked out players in the National Basketball Association. We recently brought you news of LeBron James playing at the Mandel JCC in Cleveland, and now TMZ reports that the man he's trying to unseat as the greatest player in the league, Kobe Bryant, was shooting hoops at a JCC as well. The man who calls himself the Black Mamba engaged in a private training session at the JCC in Irvine, California this week. With basketball returning to major arenas this month thanks to a new collective bargaining agreement between the NBA and the Players Association, this is likely the last we'll hear of NBA players spending their time among the boobies and babies of local JCCs. However, it's possible that some Jewish attitudes have rubbed off on them. Both James and Bryant will be working on Christmas this year, as their teams have games scheduled for that day. There's no word yet on whether they'll be having Chinese food for their post-game meals. 
But if Jews can increase their relationships with professional basketball players, what other groups can they become more familiar with? How about Muslims? As Christian Eden reports, an effort is underway for just that. A rabbi and an imam walk into the Y. It sounds like a joke, but at the 92Y's recent program, Building a Global Muslim-Jewish Alliance, a rabbi and an imam really did sit down to discuss bridging the communication gap between Muslims and Jews. The discussion, which kicked off a new season of events for the Foundation for Ethnic Understanding at 92Y, featured Hampton Synagogue's rabbi Mark Schneier in conversation with Imam Muhammad Shamsi Ali from the Islamic Cultural Center of New York. And Schneier noted the numerical necessity of bringing the two religions into a closer dialogue. As a Jew, I know that 14 million Jews cannot remain in the state of conflict with almost 1.4 billion Muslims. And how often have I said that Muslims and Jews as the children of Abraham, that not only do we share a common faith, but we share a common fate. To hear more about building a global Muslim-Jewish alliance, please tune into the full broadcast edition of the Week in Review. Thank you, Christian. Jewish cultural contributions in the United States very often line up in two categories, the arts and left-wing activism. What happened when both of those combined in the middle of the last century? Meredith Gansman finds out. If a picture is worth a thousand words, then the work of the New York Photo League is worth much more. In 1936, a group of young photographers, most of them Jewish first-generation Americans, started the Photo League in Manhattan. The League's documentary photography focused on capturing everyday life on the streets of New York during the turbulent times of the Great Depression, World War II, and the Cold War. The League's work is now on display in the Radical Camera at the Jewish Museum in New York City. Exhibit curator Mason Klein explains the photographs are surprisingly relevant to today's current events. Well, it, it, it is timely, and we did not foresee that, nor was it an intention. Uh, to put a newsreel of unemployment lines and demonstrations that are happening throughout the world today. Looking at the photographs, one could mistake the images for the present day. But in their time, the Photo League's work innovated art's place in society, making it relevant to the wider public. And they decided that art could matter, art and photography could inform the public and really in some way become more than just illustration and a newsreel kind of context. Images documenting storefronts, subway lines, and average New Yorkers shed new light on the city. The Photo League was the first movement that really began to look at the urban environment of New York as the symbol of modernity and how best to really understand how people related. To see more on the Radical Camera and the New York Photo League, watch the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. Finally, we're all familiar with the story of Anne Frank, whose diary during the Holocaust remains a much-read book. But the last of those who knew her personally is telling her story in a different manner. Christian Neaton has that story. The only living relative who knew Anne Frank when she was alive visited the 92nd Street Y recently to give a very personal perspective on the family life of the famous diarist. Booty Elias and his wife Gertie read excerpts from a cache of 6,000 never-before-seen family documents discovered in the attic of their family home in Basel, Switzerland. They also showed photos of the extended Frank family, and Booty recalled visits from Anne and her family before the onset of the Holocaust that ultimately claimed her life. They came often to us to Switzerland, spent their vacation with us in Basel or in Sils Maria and the Engadin. She was a wild little girl, and I loved her very much. We had lots of fun together. And that was going very well until 1940, when the German army invaded Holland. The portals were closed. They couldn't come anymore. But we could still correspond. And Anne was always a writer. She already, as a child, she wrote many letters to us. Many of them were saved. And uh, 
correspondence went on. To hear more about a new book about the Frank family, please tune into the full broadcast edition of the Week in Review. Thank you, Christian. That's all for this week. From all of us here at the Jewish Channel, be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 528, IO Optimum Channel 291, RCN Channel 268, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, Cox Channel 1, Frontier Communications, and now on Comcast Cable in the on-demand menu under Premium Channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.